today's class is about that process of problem solving. Um, how we approach a problem by first understanding what the problem is, and then second, coming up with a plan, some way of getting us closer to the solution, um, and then carrying out that plan, and last but not least, verifying that the solution that you came up with actually connects back to the original question. So this, the particulars of this process, and I'm labeling them with single words here just to make it easy, understand it, plan it, execute it, and then verify it. Um, this four-step process was first sort of put down on paper by a mathematician named George Paglia. Um, he spent half of his mathematical career in Zurich uh, at ETH and the other half in Stanford uh, out in California. Uh, one of the probably the largest figures in mathematical problem solving uh, ever to have worked in the field. Um, and so we want to just get experience today, basically, uh, applying this method to see how it can help us to solve some rather intricate problems as we go through the course of today. Before we go any further into actually solving this, we want our philosopher moment of the day, right? Our connection between what we do here and what you do in your logical reasoning class or in philosophy in general. Now, Polya's method for a four-step solution to a problem is another example of something we talked about on Tuesday as being a heuristic. Heuristics are the little kind of rules of thumb that structure our most of our everyday thoughts. They're the quick judgments, like recognizing your friend's face or knowing that that car in the other lane is going to hit you, right? Um, those sorts of things that we don't have to think too deeply about because we just react to them. Those are what heuristics are. Um, but the thing about problem solving and why you should think that it's a bit weird and artificial to have one section in an entire textbook that's called problem solving and the rest of it is about other things, when really all of math and all of critical reasoning is about problem solving, is that it is in fact impossible to come up with one method that can solve every potential problem in the world. There's not even one method that can solve every potential problem in mathematics because there are so many, uncountably many, unsolved problems even in the field of math. So it's impossible, really, to come up with one method that can solve every problem in the world. But this Polya's method is kind of good. It's kind of time-tested, that it solves a lot of the kinds of problems that at least that we would like to be concerned about in this class, and really even outside of the walls of our classroom. A lot of problems in the world can be tackled using a method like this. But it's kind of vague. It's kind of prescriptive. But experience shows that at most times, if we follow a process like this, we're going to come to a solution to the problem if we have all the information that we need. So that's the sense in which Polly's method really is a heuristic. It's kind of a rule of thumb. It's not guaranteed always to work, but experience shows most of the time it's pretty good. Just like saying a half a mile when the wine tasting is really 0.4182579 miles away. It, it works. It's pretty good. It's good enough. All right, so here's the problem that uh, that I'm going to work on, and we can sort of, you know, all uh, contribute. You're each going to work on your own problem in your groups as we go forward. Um, so let me describe this problem. I call it a handshake problem. Uh, in it, a meetup group, I've made it a surfing meetup group because why not, um, holds a mixer event, and so they get a bunch of new members. In this example, they have 12 new members um, that are all hoping to make connections and meet one another. Um, and the challenge is this, that every new member to this meetup group has to have a 10-minute conversation with two other new members at a time. So they get into groups of three, basically. Um, and after they've had a 10-minute conversation with a group of three people, then they have to go to another group of three and have a conversation there, and another group of three and have a conversation there, and so on. Um, and the question is, how long is it going to take for each of the new members in this meetup group to have that 10-minute conversation with each different pair of people in the room? At minimum, how long is it going to take? So the first step in this process is that first reading and understanding step. So we want to look over it and say, what is this problem that you're solving? What, what is a solution going to look like? This is also an underrated step. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been teaching an algebra class and there's a problem whose solution should be a number, but the student writes down like an equation or something as an answer. Clearly, right off the bat, when I'm looking at that as a grader, I know that that's not the right solution because the solution needs to look like a number. Uh, and vice versa. It happens both ways in, in algebra. So knowing what your solution should look like ahead of time really gives you a, a jump on that verification step at the end. If you know from the outset that my solution is going to be an even number and then you get to the end and your answer is odd, then your verification step is already done for you. You know it can't be correct. Right? Um, so knowing what the solution should look like ahead of time uh, is a good idea. Also, in this step, as you read through the problem several times, 
you should be looking for things that you all spotlighted when we talked about the problem solving process a minute ago. First of all, figure out what you know. What do we know in this problem? What information is already on the table in front of us? Um, and then this is that same step as what will the solution look like? What information do we need? What are we really looking for? What do we not know, but we need to know in order to solve this problem? And then along the way, what are the rules of the game? In other words, in this problem-solving process, what do we have to be keeping in mind as we go along that kind of determines for us whether the steps that we're taking are valid or not? Logical reasoning, more often than not, supplies the rules of most games that are played to solve problems in a mathematics course or in any sort of uh, hard critical thinking uh, setting. But knowing all this stuff up front, is, uh, up front is important. So let's go back and look at the statement of this handshake problem one more time. Um, and read it over carefully. In this example, if we read it through critically and carefully, what information do we have in this handshake problem that's going to help us, that we're going to need to know uh, in order to solve it? So by the time we've read through this carefully, we kind of know what are the key little, the essence, the little kernels, the, uh, the nuts and bolts of what we need to know out of this problem. There are 12 new members, and every one of them has to have a conversation with two other new members at a time, each of those conversations should last 10 minutes, and then they have to do it again, to repeat with two other new members, and so on. Okay. So there's the statement of the problem when you read it carefully. Step two along the way is coming up with the plan. And I will be completely honest with you and say this is the hardest of the four steps, without question, the hardest of the four steps. Because it's the one where the most creativity needs to be plugged in. Because there's not just out there some finite list of here are the different methods that you can use to solve a problem, and every problem will fall into one of these categories. The world is too big for that. Um, but some possible heuristics that you can use to devise a plan for solving a problem include the things that are listed up here. Can you find a pattern in some of the information that you've been giving, and then plug in the inductive reasoning that we did in section 1.1 to help solve that problem? Uh, another classic trope is to solve a problem that's similar which you know how to solve, right? Uh, if it makes a difference to change some small element of the problem to make it much easier for you, do that and then solve the simpler problem and see if that solution can tell you something about the more difficult problem. And then uh, is there a simpler problem I can use? Maybe take big numbers and make them into much smaller numbers and try solving that little example. Maybe the little example will give you a clue as to how to solve the big example. Um, another great idea is to draw pictures. Can I visualize it? Uh, if, you, if you're a visually oriented uh, learner like I am, for example, um, that's a, definitely a good first step. Um, also, sometimes it helps just to restate the problem. Can I restate the problem in different words that mean the same thing but might help to illuminate uh, a plan a little bit better. For me, in my example, for the handshake problem, what I'd like to do is let's start by drawing a picture. I like pictures, and since we only have 12 uh, people in this problem, it shouldn't be too hard to draw a picture that makes sense. So here I'm going to just kind of put some 12 people, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, uh, 11, Let's give them names. Why not A, B, C, D? These are really creative names. I'm not even sure if uh, you could put these on a birth certificate. I bet you could. I bet there's someone out there whose name is L. Um, so, um, so now here I'm looking at my 12 people. I can look in this example at all 12 of them. Um, and if I want to start looking at groups of three to have conversations, maybe my first groups are ABC, and they can talk to EFG, or sorry, EFG can talk together, IJK can talk together, DH and L can talk together, uh, and maybe ship some packages while they're at it. Uh, and that is one group, right? So there's one 10 minute session uh, that I could have here. So a plan for me could be just to take this diagram and draw every possible combination uh, that I can draw and just sort of count them up as we go along. That's an example of a plan that I might use to solve this problem. Um, because looking ahead, I think we have a lot more combinations than I'm going to be able to draw in this picture. So between now and Tuesday, I think I'm going to choose a different strategy for my handshake problem as well. Um, one that maybe involves not pictures, but maybe making a list 